Okay, uh, I think we can start the next talk. Our next speaker will be Jess Halford, and he will give us a talk, Software 7 Deadly Wastes. Please give him a warm welcome. Hello. Um, I have uh, a website address here which is really big. So if you're at the back of the room and you can't read the text, some of the text is smaller than this, if you can't read it uh, and you want to download the slides, um, you go ahead. Um, jazzalford.com slash talks. That name, Jess Alford, is on the next slide as well, so the only part you need to remember is .com slash talks. So I'm going to move on. Um, so I'm Jez, I, I try to help uh, teams of software developers go faster. Um, and a lot of this stuff is applicable to teams. So if you're sort of on your own, you probably don't encounter as many of these problems uh, that I'm going to talk about as a team of people would. But there are still bits that might be familiar to you. So, um, my background is in, is in uh, web development and, and software development. Then I did some DevOps, um, and now I do this kind of hand-wavy, coachy stuff where I talk about processes and feelings. Um, so if I asked you what slows you down, you've probably got a few ideas already. And it might be uh, our build server is really slow, and it takes ages for us to, to get a, a, a usable build out. Or it might be similar, but with deployments. Or it might be uh, our code is too complex, and it takes us ages to dig in and figure out how to make a change safely. Or it might be the product guy's talking riddles, and I can never understand what I'm supposed to be building. But those are all quite specific problems. But they all fall into different kind of categories. And those categories come from the seven wastes. So the seven wastes come from the Toyota production system. Uh, and I think in the, in the notes for this talk, in the little spiel on the website, it says that the Toyota production system was developed at the turn of the 20th century. That's my fault. It's, it wasn't the turn of the 20th century. Nobody was doing mass car production at the turn of the 20th century. It was very much the middle of the 20th century. So historians among you may have spotted that. Um, and it comes uh, out, of the, out of that system and out of those clever guys at Toyota, we have this, this word, which I think is pronounced murder. I don't speak Japanese. If anybody here has a better idea of how to pronounce that, please let me know. Um, I've done this talk a few times, and nobody's ever corrected me. So I'm just going to keep going with murder. Like that. It sounds right to me. OK, so this was. This Toyota production system thing, this was a precursor to the idea of lean manufacturing, which you may have heard of. Lean manufacturing is stuff like um, my, oh, I didn't start my timer, very bad. Lean manufacturing is stuff like um, the guy who bolts wheels onto a car um, only wants to have exactly as many wheels as he needs at any given time, because otherwise he's kind of knocking them over and they're getting in his way. It's things like that. But it's all very applicable to software. I'm not the first person to apply it to software. It's been done before, but it's perhaps not as widely known as it could be. So let's look at the wastes. Let's try and look at the wastes. Come on, there we go. Let's look at the wastes. I've used films to illustrate the wastes. In longer slots, um, I turn this into a quiz where you can name the film. Um, I don't think I've got time to play a quiz, uh, so just do it in your heads. And if you get it right, congratulate yourself. Um, so the first of the wastes is transport. And transport is movement of work. So whenever we are doing a piece of work and then handing it over to somebody else, so for example, I'm a back-end developer, and I'm hacking away on my keyboard, and I finish, and I go, right, there you go, front-end guys. I built you an API. All yours. Often that will cause slowness, because there's confusion, or there's misunderstanding, or there's in simply waiting for the front-end guys to be free. So that is an example of transport. If you've ever handed something off to QA and thought, brilliant, my job is done, and then they've sent it back to you and said, oh, no, it's not, and then you've had an argument about what the purpose of the thing was supposed to be, 
or whether the, the QA people are making up requirements that you didn't think existed, that's transport waste. As well as that, things like deployments to different environments. If I've got to deploy something laboriously into a dev environment, and then I've got to laboriously deploy it into a QA environment, and laboriously deploy it into a UAT environment, and then laboriously deploy it into production, that's transport as well, because you're moving stuff around. The original idea behind transport waste in, in manufacturing is stuff like somebody builds a railway through the middle of a factory and you've got to drag everything over a bridge. Software is a little less tangible. Okay, so there's obviously a few solutions to this. We can pair our back-end developers with our front-end developers and develop the thing simultaneously. We have tools like continuous integration servers that will get builds ready and even deploy them automatically for us so we don't have to take the step and we don't notice the waste. And automation generally, if you have to build new environments, provision servers, all that magical stuff uh, where you can automate it with things like Ansible, Puppet, or even serverless, um, that will help you reduce your transport waste. I'm going to move on to the next waste. The next waste is inventory. Inventory is undelivered work. So any kind of work which you've started but not finished is waste, according to the Toyota production system, because it doesn't have any value. You haven't realized that value if you haven't shipped it. So if somebody says to you, oh, we really need, we really need to do this, this feature, and you go, okay, that's no problem. Uh, start working on the feature, bash it out, almost done, and then they go, oh, hang on, that, no, that's not important anymore. What's really important now is this thing. And then you go, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll put that to one side. I'll, I'll do this next thing. And then they go, oh, actually, it turns out that first thing was really quite important, uh, but also can you change it to this? And before you know it, you've got four or five different things all on your plate at the same time. I see some, some sage nodding out there. Um, so that inflation of the amount of stuff that's in your process will slow you down. Um, and there's a mathematical principle behind this called Little's Law. And Little's Law roughly states that the more stuff we work on at a given moment, the slower our rate of delivery will be. So the more stuff in the system, the slower uh, the rate at which stuff will exit the system. And it's maths and it is provable. It sounds sort of weird, but it is true. So, kind of best weapon against this is ship it, ship it, ship it. Ship little, ship often. Because if you can get your feature out the door before somebody changes their mind about how important it was, you won't feel so bad. So, we can do things like small deliverable units, feature toggles so that we can get stuff out the door but not necessarily show it to our users. This is why stuff like that is really useful. Um, but another really good uh, kind of tactic is visualizing our work in progress. So who has a board like this? Yeah, I see some hands. That's good. But the problem with this board is that it's full of stuff. Each of those post-it notes represents an item of work in progress. Now, if you've got a team of 50, that's brilliant because they're probably only all doing one thing at a time. But if you've got a more typical uh, team size, that's kind of a problem because if there are, say, I don't know, eight of you, you're each doing five or six things. And you can't all do five or six things. You're, you're humans. You can only focus on one thing at a time. And you should only focus on one thing at a time. But this uh, visualization, this tool, physically putting it on the wall and saying, hey, look how messy this is, is a really good way of kind of changing hearts and minds about why inventory is bad. It's time for the next waste. Forest represents motion. Uh, motion is the movement of people around the work. This is different to transport. Transport, we were moving the work from one place to another. Now we're moving people around the work. So you can see stuff like task switching. Again, related. Irregular meetings. If I encounter a problem, we're building the wrong thing, the client's changed the spec, something like that, you're probably all going to have to have a crisis meeting and figure it all out and work out what the problem is. The analogy and the similarity between that and, oh no, a car has fallen off the production line, 
it's basically the same thing. Car falls off the production line in the Toyota factory, and all the managers run down from the office and go, how the hell did this happen? And they clear up the mess. It's the same situation where you have something unexpected in software delivery, you all gather around and go, oh, what are we going to do? Building new environments is sort of related, but it's kind of like coalescing stuff, people or resources or things around problems that I'm talking about. So, Johnny Cash has advice for us. Johnny Cash, he says, get rhythm. And get rhythm is your best defense against motion. Why do we have a daily stand-up meeting, if you do have a daily stand-up meeting? Well, I think the reason we have a daily stand-up meeting is so that we can have our conversations at a known and predictable time and hopefully avoid having to have five or six ad hoc conversations or meetings through the day. So we're immediately reducing our motion. We have the daily stand-up, that's one thing, one piece of motion, it's predictable. And it's the same on a slightly bigger scale. The reason we have sprints is that we plan a small amount of work up front, do it in detail, and we hope that reduces the amount of chaos in running around later on. Not that sprints are necessarily always the solution, but it's an example. So that's why we have stuff like that, and that's why motion is useful, uh, or why we try to reduce motion. But if you, even if you can't manage you know, something as, as regimented as sprints or as, or as um, organized as daily stand-ups, any kind of rhythm you can introduce, you know, always talk about new features on a Wednesday afternoon, you know, always ship on a Thursday, anything like that, um, will help to increase predictability and it will help your developers to feel autonomous, to feel like they know what they're doing. So, the next film is kind of hard to guess, but it represents waiting. This is a scene from Apocalypse Now, and I think the actual scene lasts about a second and a half. But he kind of looks like he's waiting, so I thought, you know, that would do. So, waiting is delays in delivering work. You all know what waiting is. You've probably all experienced waiting. And my best example of waiting is I was, I was working at a large FTSE 100 company, a lot of developers, um, and a team that was responsible for networking. And the networking team were very precious about their firewall. Quite rightly, firewalls are very important keep us all safe. Um, but I needed, I needed to knock some holes in the firewall because I needed to talk to some new APIs and stuff. So they're like, oh, that's okay, you tell us, tell us far enough in advance and we'll arrange that and then uh, you, can, you can have your ports open or whatever and it's, it's not a problem. So get myself organized, okay, these ports please, I don't know that. Working away, building a glorious features that will save the world and you know, make, make the world a better place or you know, whatever it might be, correcting spelling mistakes on, on home pages, who knows. Um, and I go, oh no, I just need to call this API and I can't, there's a hole in the firewall. So I think, oh, they're, they're gonna hate me. So I pick up the phone to the networks team and I say, oh, I need another, I need another hole in the firewall. And the guy says, oh, now. He says, if you had asked me yesterday, I could have done it straight away because we'd met all our sprint goals. But now you're gonna have to wait two weeks. And obviously I didn't wait two weeks, I just escalated it to their manager and then they got chatted out. And, but you know, that situation doesn't make anybody happy, does it? It's irritating. So that kind of waiting is, it's a hard problem. There's a, a blog post I, I read a couple of weeks ago, it's relatively new by a guy called John Cutler, which is why Agile isn't working, which you might have seen. Um, and he estimates in that, that 85% of the time between starting work on a feature and delivering that feature, nobody is doing any work on that feature. So 85% of the time it's sitting there waiting for somebody to come along and move it forward a little bit. Can you imagine what the world would be like if we could reduce that 85%? That's like four out of the five working days in a week almost, or more than in fact. We could all work one day a week and still be as productive as we are now, if only we could fix this. I for one would love to work one day a week. So, this is a hard problem, right? This, I'm not gonna fix uh, that problem I described at that large corporation as a developer. That's for C-level management to figure out. So this is a hard problem, but there are things individuals can do. Things like talking to people. If you go to a daily stand-up 
and you say, oh, I'm just waiting for, you know, Brian in, in networking to open a port for me. And then you go to the next daily stand-up and you say exactly the same thing. What have you done in the intervening period to advance this forward? And if you run a team, the best thing you can do is encourage them to talk to each other about stuff like this. So take ownership of those problems, grasp them, push them forward, and try and get away from a culture of just like, oh, I'll put that down for a moment because I can't move it on, and I'll do something else. Because then you've created inventory as well. We know we don't want inventory. So, consider the whole system. Try and avoid having teams that are external that you rely on. But I appreciate this one's a hard problem. Okay, the next one, it's quite an easy fill. Um, but it represents over-processing. Now, over-processing is kind of uh, obsessing over things. And Gollum kind of obsesses over things, right? He's, he's, he's pretty keen on that uh, ring dealy. Um, so, this is basically working too hard. Who enjoys working too hard? I sure don't. That's why I do, you know, hand wavy, telling people they're doing it wrong type work instead of real work. Um, so over processing is, is kind of uh, gold plating. You know the, the popular acronym YAGNI? You ain't gonna need it. Well, that's what this is all about. Um, a classic one is, is the, the solving imaginary scaling issues thing. Um, so you, you attempted sometimes to think, you know, I just coded a, a computationally expensive thing. Um, so I'd better build a caching layer around that, um, which means I'd better, you know, provision a, 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 a caching server farm across our entire estate. Uh, oh, and I'd better build in high availability and triple redundancy into that just in case. And, you know, that's kind of a bit mad if all you're doing is what most of us, I think, probably do, which is sort of business software and stuff that isn't really that exciting. If you are Facebook or you are, you know, something web scale or Amazon or whatever, you knock yourself out, um, build, build for scale. But I think a lot of the time we don't really realize that servers are really quite powerful on their own. Um, libraries instead of operational code, uh, I have done this. I, I, my first job out of university, um, I was a PHP developer. And at the time, PHP didn't have uh, a, a resource for sharing libraries. It didn't have Composer, which it has now. Same kind of thing as uh, Ruby Gems or NPM or uh, Python X. If, is it Python X? I don't know. Um, so I was like, oh, we needed a collections library. So I was like, oh, I, I've, just, I've just learned about computer science. I can write a collections library. So I wrote an entire collections library, um, and we used probably a tenth of it. But, you know, we could have unshifted a queue if we'd ever had a queue. But we never did, because actually all we needed was a simple stack implementation. So stuff like that, getting carried away, that's... That's over-processing. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the, the Practical Dev, you will be familiar with these enjoyable O'Reilly books. It's not a real book, but I kind of wish it was. <laughs> um, the text at the top, if you can't read it, says, getting the wrong idea from the conference talk you've attended. Which <laughs> kind of worries me, but, you know, I trust you. Um, so, again, this is another reason why we should deliver often. If you are, uh, you know, if you have an imperative to ship stuff, then you're going to be less inclined to do this kind of polishing and making it nice. There's a time and a place for polishing and making it nice, but it's dangerous because sometimes it might not be useful. Um, hopefully, you base all your performance improvements on evidence and not on imagination. Uh, you know, how long does that computationally expensive thing take? Um, so, based on evidence, refactor when you need to. Okay. This is from The Shining. And uh, it represents overproduction, because Jack has been busy typing the same sentence over and over again. Uh, and that's overproduction. So, um, there's a... A fun statistic there, which may be nonsense, may be nonsense, but it's a compelling number, which is that 64% of built software features are rarely or never used. Now, I don't know if it's exactly 64%, but I've got a feeling that that's probably a, a pretty good stab at the actual figure. 
Um, so if you're building a feature that nobody's ever going to use, well, that's clearly a problem. Um, and remember, every feature has a cost. It has to be tested. It has to be integrated. It has to be maintained. So it has to be compiled. It adds complexity. It's a potential point of failure. It's a potential attack vector. If nobody actually uses it and you don't get any business value for it, you're clearly wasting your time. And actually, the guy who invented the Toyota production system, or one of the guys, uh, a guy called Tashi Ono, this was his favorite, or his least favorite, I suppose, because the point was, you might do all of the other wastes in the course of building something that was never useful in the first place. OK. We can avoid this kind of thing with strong product ownership, having a good idea about what we're doing, getting fast feedback from our users. And remember, remove stuff if you're not going to use it. OK, it's time for the last one. This is defects. Um, and defects are bugs, right? We know what defects are. And we know that bugs in production are bad news. But we also know that bugs before production are still kind of bad. So if you're building something and the tests seem like they're passing, that's good, and you push it to the build server and it builds OK, it goes to the QA guys, and the QA guys test it, and they go, oh yeah, it looks like it works. Uh, OK, move it over to UAT, having spent 85% of the time waiting, move it over to UAT, and the product manager looks at it and says, no, that isn't what I wanted, that's rubbish. Look how much time you've wasted in that process. That's a pre-production defect. You might congratulate yourself and go, oh, it's a good thing we checked that before we shipped it. But you've still wasted a tremendous amount of time. So kind of the best defense against that, obviously automated tests catch things early. Dev prod parity, always useful. Continuous integration, building stuff, merging often. But that last one, where the product person at the last minute says, oh, actually, that's not what I meant, that's harder. And you need shared understanding to avoid that. So if you're doing BDD, that's really useful. There's a technique known as OOPSI, O-O-P-S-I, which I learned about recently, which is a bit like user stories, but they just make a whole lot more sense. Look that up, I recommend. That kind of thing will stop these problems from occurring. So, I'm gonna summarize. Ship small, ship often. Automate things that bore you. Do one thing at a time, please. Maintain a regular pace and a regular rhythm. Fix stuff early, don't wait. And prioritize working code over perfection. And that is basically the secret sauce. I see lots of people taking photos of this slide, which is good, that was my hope. It's gone well. Okay, so that's the end. Um, I don't think we have time for questions, but if you want to talk to me afterwards, I would very gladly talk to you. But thank you very much. Okay, so thanks, Jess, and 